Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Brash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. This is a very special program for me for a couple of reasons. The first, obviously, is the fact that I've got three terrific special guests all at the same time. Now, I asked Christina, how do you pronounce your YouTube name? Because Christina Rad is also known as Z-O-M-G. I was like, is it Zom Gitz? Zom, Zom, <laughs> what is it? Well, I guess... It's it's sort of uh, relative. Everybody says it a different way, but she said you can say it's uh, Z O Z O M G. It's Chris, or Zo oh my God, it's Chris. But you you know her online from her uh, from her YouTube handle, and also as Christina Rad. She spoke at the Reason Rally. She's got uh, YouTube fans all around the world. She does her show from her home from Romania, and it was for that reason that we pre-recorded our hour-long conversation because it was just impossible to make the time difference work. But it was a great hour, and it was um, it was her, it was uh, Thunderfoot and D.P.R. Jones, who's based in London. So we had this conversation, and I wanted to tie it into the charity fund drive that we are doing right now in the month of April 2012 on The Thinking Atheist. In fact, if you were to go right now to thethinkingatheist.com, you will see links to to give to two wonderful secular charities. And, and I wanted to do this conversation and make it an opportunity to remind everybody that I would love for you, if you can, if you would, if you feel so inclined, to help us toward a very ambitious goal of $30,000 to be given, to be divided evenly, relatively evenly, between two different secular organizations. The first one is called Charity Water. And I found out about Charity Water through uh, Bill Morgan, who spoke at the Oklahoma Free Thought Convention last year. He was an, uh, Bill used to be an ORU professor, and I've had him on the show a few times. Back in the inaugural years of Oral Roberts University, he was a believer and he was on the staff and and ultimately, his journey took him out of religion, and he went on to become a successful businessman. And he brought Charity Water to my attention, and I just thought, what an amazing idea. We talked about how difficult it is in cultures and communities in developing nations where they don't even have clean sanitary water. And, and such a high percentage of those people, the, the tens of thousands of people a week who die, die due to the unsanitary conditions that they live in. It affects everything. And instead of just throwing money at it, Charity Water goes in and they put up these water projects, these wells and whatnot, and provide them clean, drinkable, safe, sanitary water. And I thought it's a tangible solution. I think it's about $5,000 per well. The organization is set up so that 100% of the money given goes directly to the water projects. And I thought that'd be a great first charity. The second charity is called Responsible Charity. And it was it was put together essentially by by a guy who had worked in other charity organizations and seen the waste, right? He he'd seen where the money should go and did not. <laughs> and he saw the people who were not being helped and he said, Screw this, there's a better way. And he founded responsible charity. And I was just so impressed with these two organizations that I wanted to use this. And I thought about playing the conversation, you know, I thought, well, I guess I could play portions of the hour long event and then come back and remind everybody, hey, if you get a chance, go into the uh, description box of this video and click the donate link. And I thought that's just a shitty thing to do. <laughs> Don't do that to the audience, you know, don't do that to the listeners. You know, when we come back, we're going to talk about what does Thunderfoot think of whatever. I thought, well, that's just dumb. And we don't we don't address the charities at all in the conversation. But but before I kick it off, before I hit the play button, I do want to take a second and say we are well on our way toward a goal of thirty thousand dollars. It's a chance to do some good without any God, without invoking any deity or religions. 
a work or holy book or anything like that, just because we are helping fellow men and women and young people all around the world. So if you benefit at all from the Thinking Atheist community, I will shamelessly ask you at this moment to either go to the thinkingatheist.com website or click one of the links in the description box of this podcast and give a few bucks. I'm not too shy. I'll ask. Do it. You know, we've had people, we've had thousands given just today. I think uh, as of this moment, and this obviously this number will change by the time the video goes up to YouTube and whatnot, we're well over 10,000 total and, uh, and going strong. So please, I encourage you, it feels good to do something for other people and ignore the cynics and the skeptics who say nothing ever changes. <laughs> you know, nothing ever changes. It doesn't matter. I think it does. And I, I hope you'll uh, I hope you'll you'll participate. I, I wanted to start as well before I kick off the uh, the interview section. I got an email from a guy named Michael. It's real short, but I got it this morning and I asked him for permission to share it with you because it deals with doing good, right? Doing good without God. And how often do we as non-believers have to put up with, well, you can't have any morals if you don't have God, if you're not a Christian, right? They, they always say you can't know true goodness. You can't, you can't um, be a good person. I hear it all the time. And Michael sent me a letter, and I thought it was relevant. So real fast, let me share this with you. He said, I've watched your videos and loved them. I listened to your podcast while on my commute. I wanted to contact you to refute the most irritating theist argument. I hate it when the religious say that a person cannot be good without God. But not only am I a caring, loving husband and family man without God, but I save people's lives on a daily basis, I am a 911 dispatcher. People call me on the worst day of their lives. They were attacked or raped or their house burned down or they lost a child. I talk to them while they hide in the closet or under the bed while their house is being ransacked. I've helped a woman give birth to twins on the side of the road at 2 a.m. in an SUV while waiting for an ambulance. I do these things on a daily basis basis without being told to by some superior being. I don't need a God to tell me to help people who need help. And I don't need to be threatened with hell to make me stay on the phone with a crying child whose parents beat her until the police arrive. I just wanted to share with you that there are thousands of us who help save lives every day without the promise of heaven if we do a good job. We are dispatchers and cops and firemen and ambulance drivers. We are good without God every time we stop a crime, every time we talk someone down from suicide, and every time we save a life. Perfectly said. Thank you so much from Michael in Louisiana. And for your approval, DPR Jones joined us a little bit late in the conversation. He was about 10, I think 15, 10, 15 minutes late getting to the, uh, the conference call. So we begin our recorded conversation with Thunderfoot and Christina Rad. Let's start real fast talking about the Reason Rally, a huge event on the National Mall in D.C. I'd never done anything like it. I told somebody it was it's an American phenomenon, but it was almost like being back in the 60s when all the hippies hopped in the, the van to go to Woodstock. You know, they were going to this. We're going to the we're going to this event. We're going to be a part of it, man. And I've I really kind of got caught up in that during the reason rally. Did you feel any of that when you were there? You know, the energy of the people and the enthusiasm and seeing all these infidels together in one place. Did you find yourself kind of intoxicated by the day? Either one of you? Towards the end of it, yes. For the first half of it, I was busy having a nervous breakdown. <laughs> because you took the stage. You were speaking in front of tens yes. of thousands of people. Yes. You're backstage, and what's going on? Is your heart about to explode out of your chest? Exactly. It was pretty bad. It was pretty brutal. But you're I not shy. I actually become professional. I, I don't know. I have, a, I guess you call it stage fright. Like, no, no matter what it is, it just happens if I'm alone on stage. If I'm with a bunch of people or I'm having a back and forth conversation, it's fine. But if I'm supposed to hold a monologue, then it's it's bad. Do you remember one word you said from the stage? Do, do you remember any of it? 
Yes, I actually remember about 20% of my speech. <laughs> I saw a photograph of Tim Minchin. He was giving you a great big hug. Was that before? Uh, that was backstage. Know. Is that before or after you spoke? Oh, my God. It was after. Uh, and it was all strange because Tim Minchin was in the, well, VIP tent where or all the speakers were. And I wanted to go up to him because I he's like my favorite person ever. And I wanted to go up to him and, you know, talk to him, say hi, ask for an autograph or a picture. But I was like so, so, so scared and so petrified that I couldn't. And then I walk off the stage and there he is hugging me. It was just surreal. I was like, am I imagining it? Thunderfoot, talk to me. I saw people were walking up to you from everywhere. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was a regular roller coaster ride. And... The the thing that stunned me and still stuns me is just how young the people there were. That you really did get the feel that, it, like you were saying, it, it was Woodstock. It was it was young people, energetic despite the rain. I read a survey that said that people under the age of thirty are twice as likely today as they were in 1990 to identify themselves as non-religious, and those numbers are really beginning to escalate. And I myself see this, I get emails, I'm sure you do as well, emails and correspondence from teenagers, from 20-somethings. Are you guys seeing that? Young people who say, my parents, my grandparents, my culture, they're all really religious, but I'm just not buying it anymore. You guys seeing that? What well, do you hear? The hearing? messages I, I personally get are usually asking for my advice, how should they come out, you know, stuff like that, or how, at least how to deal with the fact after they've told everybody how to deal with, you know, people coming up to them all the time and, you know, saying this is just a phase or you're crazy or, you know, Satan has gotten a hold of you or something. Were either of you ever religious? Ever? Am I the only one in this conversation who came from religion? Yeah, I, I was uh, very, very religious. You could call me a fundamentalist. Back in the day, I was going to the church three times a week. I was praying every night and every morning. I was, yeah, full on into it. Because your parents were? Did you just inherit their belief system? My parents, my school, you know, my, my religion teacher, this is what we were taught. We were taught creationism in school. So, I mean, when your teachers are presenting you this type of thing as facts, just like they teach you geography, just like they teach you math, they teach you creationism and you believe it. And also the parents and also everybody I knew. So I just took it as a fact because this is how it was presented to me. It wasn't even an option not to believe. So this is in Romania. Is this a public school? Yes, it was a public school. And they when... teach religion as fact in your public school systems? Well, I know they still teach religion now. I don't know if it is just as bad because I don't know any young people who are, you know, like I was, eight, nine, ten years old. So I haven't talked to anybody. I know I don't know if it is that this bad now. But yeah, this is how it used to be. So this explains why you are so passionate now about debunking yes. the creation teachings, right? Because you yes, escaped and. So that drives you, yeah? Of course, of course it does. Especially when, I mean, I, I don't know any atheists in real life. I mean, not in real life, because I've met the, the people who are living inside my computer. I met a lot of them in real life. But I'm talking about people here in my country. I don't know any atheists. I don't know any skeptics even. Everybody I know is religious. So it's probably therapeutic. You go log on, make a video, do a blog, connect with the online free thought community just to keep sane. It's not as much therapeutic as I think it is a necessity. Thunderfoot, you were never religious or what? Well, um, I probably were counted as deistic for a while. And it's one of those cute things that I actually kept a, a journal um, while I was young. So I can actually specifically give a date by which time I was as atheistic as I am now. And that was by the age of 16, where there's actually this journal entry that puts God into the same category as Jedi Knights and Super Star Destroyers. You know, they've got some sort of appeal to them, but ultimately they're fantasy. Before then, I did actually go to a religious school, but 
uh, I never really bought into any of it. You know, it's, it's one of those things when when you actually crack open the Bible, uh, the only way you can sort of sensibly accept that is if everyone else around you does and you say, well, okay, I don't really understand what the hell's going on there, but I'll, they seem to have all looked at it and know what they're doing. I'll just follow them. But when you actually sit down on your own with a book, it, how can you believe this stuff? It's crazy. Exactly. That's that's what happened to me when people ask me how did I become an atheist. Well, I read the Bible on my own. <laughs> yeah, objectively read. What do they say? Objectively read. The Bible is the greatest force for atheism ever conceived. It's absolutely I, true. For me, it wasn't. It was not even objectively. I mean, for me. I stopped going to the church because I didn't like certain things about it. There was a lot of corruption. I didn't like the priests, but I still wanted to keep my faith and I still, you know, wanted to keep my religion and my relationship with God, as I called it. So I, I missed the church. I needed that kind of, you know, spiritual thing. So I started to read the Bible on my own and I didn't find God anywhere in it. I was like, what the hell is this? When I was a kid, we went to a, um, I had kind of an assembly of God, AKA non-denominational, AKA Pentecostal home life. And then it was a Baptist school and they showed us a series of films. I'm in eighth grade called a thief in the night where they talk about the end times. Jesus comes back. The believers are raptured up into the heavens and then Satan takes over the earth. And it was horrible. And they're showing these films to, to school children, impressionable children as fact talking about people being rounded up from their homes and given the mark of the beast, 666. They're being beheaded in public squares. These people are fear pimps. They use the fear of hell to keep you from asking questions. Curiosity is the enemy. This and is what gets me, is if you would behave like that in another fashion to a child, to, you know, from the age of five or something, repeatedly show them horror movies of people being beheaded and such like, and sort of say, if you don't believe in this, then this is what's going to happen to you. You would be seen as one sick puppy. And yet, you know, this is, you say it's religion and people almost get a free pass on it. It is so effective. I mean, I, I was so wrapped up in fear. When I believe in God, I was sure I'm going to hell, like sure, 100% that I'm going to hell. And, you know, every day I used to say, you know, next Monday I'm going to be good. I'm going to stop lying to my mom. I'm going to stop skipping school. When these were things that, you know, most kids do. And I saw them as these horrible sins that will get me tortured forever. So, yeah, it's pretty horrible. They give you the virus, right? The church gives you the sickness and then they sell you the cure. So they say all these things that you are naturally as a human being are bad. Let us fix you. Well, um, the sort of Ray Comfort style apologetics goes one step further. It's everyone is guilty. Even the most menial of crimes is worthy of eternal torment by these people. That's how broadly they cast the net now. You know, it's not just sort of, well, if you if you ever told a lie, then you are worthy of eternal punishment, which the uh, yeah, you say this to any sane person. They're saying, what are you talking about? That That's that's crazy. No logical, sensible, compassionate being would torture you forever for just a single finite transgression. It might not even be a real transgression. You know, you might be. Um, the, the lie of convenience, you know, no, I don't think your ass looks big in that sort of thing. Am I now doomed to eternity in hell for that one statement? Well, I mean, th this sort of stuff is not coming from Ray Comfort, obviously. This is in the Bible. And with lying, you know, it's not, uh, well, you don't look fat in that jeans kind of a lie. It's more, you know, testifying against your neighbor. So telling a lie with bad intent. That's the sin of it. But uh, yes, people are all about Jesus and Jesus this, Jesus that. And in fact, it is an improvement, the New Testament from the Old Testament, because you have the entire love everybody type of thing. But at the same time, you know, Jesus says that if you just look at another person with lust, that's adultery. 
Actually, so you're... That, that, that's a that's a bastardization of Roy Comfort, and I've been over him. I went over that with him. What it's basically saying is the eyes wander before you actually commit adultery. In other words, you are thinking about it long before you actually do it. That's If you actually read it, just read the Bible straight, that's the meaning that comes to me. Is okay, that probably if, if, depends if on the translation, because in the Romanian translation, it's pretty clear that this is what it says. It's okay if you're sorry about it, because then you ask for forgiveness and you're forgiven, but even that counts as a sin. What was taught to us was, if you look, if your eyes are wandering and you see something that causes you feelings of lust, and you look away, you're fine. But if then if you look yeah. back, <laughs> if yeah. you look back a second time, well, look out, because that's exactly. lust. Yeah, yeah. DPR Jones has joined us. Better late than never. Glad you're here. And you. it was a pleasure to meet you at the Reason Rally. Likewise. You know, having DPR, Thunderfoot, and Christina all on this particular call, I'm suddenly struck by the fact that I'm the only one who has an accent that does not make me sound smarter. I'm <laughs> just the only one who, you know, I have an accent, but it doesn't do me all that many favors. I sound like the guy who's trying to, who's, who's there to tune up your car. <laughs> well, yeah, they, they might. They might. They'll learn to fake it. That's what we all do. So there was, uh, we were setting up a, an interview or something, Christina, this was last year, and you disappeared for like weeks and then afterwards said, oh, sorry, we had a snowstorm. <laughs> I'm sorry. What kind of snowstorm knocks you guys off the grid for almost a month? What happened? Well, this is not in all of the country, but I live in the middle of nowhere. So nobody really bothers if there are issues here because this is a tourist area for the summertime. And I only have like one neighbor. So, you know, who's going to come here for two people? <laughs> I have this with that? visual of you, you know, you're, you're building it. You've got a fire. You've built a fire in the middle of the living room and you're sitting there, you know, rubbing your hands together trying to survive. I don't know why I have that picture in my mind. No, I wouldn't do that. I would probably burn the house down. DPR Jones tried. presents the Magic Sandwich Show on Blog TV. Can you just tell me what... The Magic Sandwich Show is one of the best show names ever. Where did you, you get it? Did you guys just sit around the bar one night and come up with that? I would love to say that it was my idea, but I have to give credit where credit is due, and it goes to Don Exodus. Uh, the Magic Sandwich was an invention of his um, that he created around the time Shock of God was coming out with his um, uh, Give Me Proof and Evidence That Atheism is Correct and Accurate. Um, and Don used the Magic Sandwich Show as a sort of counter to that argument. But what was interesting, I thought, would, um, when we when we set up the show, there were there were other people with different ideas as to what the show should be called, and I have never had a more protracted debate with four grown men uh, that I've had uh, with uh, over what the show should be called. It was it went on for about three months. And every time we got together, you know, all the technical things and uh, important things would be sorted out straight away. And then the rest of the time would just be, well, what are we going to call ourselves? And it went on and on. Thunder will remember this. Um, I think so the great we, we had three proposed names. Everyone basically had their favorite proposed names. I think mine was Reason Radio. Um, Aaron wanted Zoptos, I think. Oh, which, God, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, which is, yeah, so it's one of these names like, not not quite like ABBA, but if you actually rotate it, if you rotate it 180 degrees, it says exactly the same thing. Um, I think yeah, the, the word is palindrome, Thunder. No, no, palindrome is something that spelt the same forwards and backwards. It was something and It doesn't have a rotational axis of symmetry. Something like that is so clever, it's too clever, and it becomes counterproductive, doesn't it? You have to, because everyone hears it and goes, what? What does that mean? Yes, at least the magic sandwich is memorable. I read DPR, I read that you were at one point, and you may still be, on a campaign to try to get the evangelist Peter Popoff off the air in the UK. Is that accurate, or was that a misstatement? No, that's that's accurate. Um, Peter Popoff is showing in the UK? Yeah. Um, he, he shows about 3 o'clock in the morning, on, on a regular basis. 
And the sad thing is that we do have a regulatory body that oversees television programs in this country. And in 2008, they actually shut Pop Off down. They removed his license. But what he has done is he has gone to Iceland, got a European license, and that allows him now to broadcast again in this country, which seems somewhat crazy. So the efforts at the moment are going into looking into how to challenge a European license. And um, I've been in touch with Iceland and the Iceland government and their regulatory bodies. Uh, but no one seems to be interested in doing anything about it. So the I'm battle sorry, against but... pop-off continues. What is this? Uh, this is the first time I hear about the guy, the guy call me ignorant, but and maybe you, other no, no, no. people... There may be many others listening. That's yeah. a great opportunity for me to explain. Peter Popoff is a, a televangelist, a traveling healing evangelist who was huge in the 80s and... Um, early 90s he was still on the air he had the the christian i did christian radio and and the the station i worked for in the early 90s actually played a 15-minute program of his he was exposed by none other than james randy the amazing randy for using an earpiece what he would do is he would have people fill out prayer cards at his healing services and they would write down their name and where they were from and what their ailment was and they turn these in well, then Peter Popoff would go out on stage. He had a hidden earpiece, and his wife would be in the back, backstage reading these prayer cards. All right, there's a uh, Steve. Steve has back trouble. And so Peter Popoff oh, would we act. we have those here. Yeah, he would act like he was hearing the voice. I, I, there's a Steve out here. Steve, let me hear you. And he goes and pulls the poor bastard out of the, out of the audience and lays hands on him, and, and he's making millions of dollars. Well, he was exposed. He supposedly filed bankruptcy, but it's been decades and the guy's still on the air and he's still a millionaire. And I look at the sheeple, I look at the, the, the viewing public and I think, how much more totally exposed does this guy have to be? To debunk does he have to be before people literally kick him out of town? What's the matter with us? And it's not just that he's making money out of it. It's like you're saying. He's making, I think, uh, I looked into Popoff. He's putting in $20 million a year, I think. Is that about right? Yes, his, his, his last IRS um, accounts uh, showed, which go back only a couple of years, 2008, 2009, that sort of period, he was making um, over $20 million. A year, and yeah, that's I mean, probably that's probably more than all of the secular organisations in America combined. But you asked what can be done about it. When I was first looking into Pop Off, I contacted um, the James Randi Foundation uh, because I thought they may be able to give me some assistance. But unfortunately, um, the the response was pretty much: um, if it's got anything to do with religion in America, no one will touch it. I'm, but how is he making so much money just for being on radio? Well, I had someone who I worked with who was a skeptic, just as an experiment, send. Uh, Peter Popoff will promise you miracles. He'll send you healing water and a healing cloth or something along those lines, some tchotchke, some icon. And then once you're on his mailing list, he will send you dozens upon dozens of requests for money. And people send in their hard-earned dollars expecting miracles. He's preying on the weak. He's preying on the elderly. He's preying on, on the gullible. And he is doing so to the tune of tens of millions of dollars. And to me, it just boggles the mind. Are people that desperate for hope, even false hope, that they're willing well, to mortgage I, I, their own homes for a miracle? I think they are. And likewise, I um, am on his mailing list under a, a number of different names. Um, and two different addresses. And in fact, I've got his latest offering in front of me, which I've not looked at yet. But the the headline seems to be at least 200 extra per month is coming to you. Um, his, his mailing, direct marketing, is where he gets most of his money from, as Seth Wright really points out. Uh, and he's quite clever in the way in which he words it. He doesn't really sell you anything. Normally, he's a gimmick. There'll be a gimmick in here somewhere. But what he asks for is a seed gift. So he sort of like plays... Hang on, I'm just opening up. Uh, well, why you should have to plant the seed with him rather than with God. Eh, I, I oh, guess that's I'll tell you what he's given. He sent me this. Time. He sent me a poster with a big picture of him on it. 
I kid you not. Oh, and there's something else. Oh, yeah. It's a little sticky thing. With, oh, acorns. There were six little <laughs> transfers of acorns. And I know what exactly what it'll be. I've got to stick these on something, and then I've got to not open another envelope, and then I've got to send him some money. And the size of my seed gift will determine how much I eventually get back from the good Lord. It, it, and that's, it's that's his like scam. I think the lottery but that. falls for it. It's kind of like playing the lottery, but with zero chance of winning. In my hometown of Tulsa, Oklahoma, there was a, an evangelist named Oral Roberts. I'm sure you've heard of him. If not, for those listening, let me explain. He was a, a huge traveling evangelist. He did tent revivals. He did healing. And he promised all the same things that Peter Popoff does. He started a university in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And, uh, and they... they Constructed it during a time uh, in the 60s, I guess, when they thought it was look, going to look cutting edge. But what it looks like is, have you ever watched the Jetsons uh, cartoon? <laughs> Everything is supposed to look, almost, it's almost sci-fi, science fiction. It's, it's very difficult. They have a prayer tower. It looks like a rocket. And they have all these other buildings. And they're all made of mirrors and whatnot. And uh, people would go. And, and he claimed that, that God appeared to him. Jesus showed up. A 900-foot-tall Jesus showed up to him and told him he needed to build a hospital, a cancer treatment hospital. And so he's raising all these millions of dollars, millions of dollars. I do remember dollars. this. And once it's built, it loses copious amounts of money. And within a few years, the thing's bankrupt, and they shut it down and turn it into an office complex. And time and again, I look at myself, and I think the omniscient, omnipotent creator of the universe has a real problem with money. <laughs> he has a difficult time keeping his enterprises solvent, you know? <laughs> I don't understand. You know, I may, I may be in a minority here, but I don't think this guy should be evicted from from the radio should be forced to step down from the radio and basically banned i mean like i said i mean i mean i'm a minority with you guys but i don't yeah. think that's the solution i mean how many scammers are out there i mean we should close the churches we should close the entire freaking vatican i mean there are so many people making money out of people just for giving them hope i think the solution is not to ban them because that way they will look like martyrs I think the solution is to educate people and try and try and try until it works. The trouble with Popoff, though, is that he is positively dangerous because he encourages people to give up their medication on the basis that he has healed them through the spirit of the good Lord. He is undoubtedly responsible for the deaths, early premature deaths, of many, many, many people because of his teachings. And, and, and I'm sorry, I disagree with you entirely. He should be shut down. He should be put in prison. But do you but think, then, though, that is... if someone walks up to voluntarily, if I walk up to a Peter Popoff or an Oral Roberts or a Robert Tilton or any of these evangelists, and I voluntarily throw out my medications and buy into what he is selling, am I not personally responsible for? Exactly. This is what I was about oh, to say. Yeah, it's, it's not it's responsible. Not... The people are responsible. No. And also, uh, so, no, I mean, no, no, no. I'm not having just this. let me finish for a bit. I mean, <laughs> as long as homeopathy is legal, because homeopathy is legal, Definitely. why shouldn't he be? You would not use that argument if he was a car salesman and your mother or grandparent had just bought a car from him which was so unreliable it went off the road at the first corner and killed her. So because what you're is talking difference? about something material and I'm giving you an example that is an actual from the same realm, from the same area. So what well, is I'm... the difference between this guy and homeopathy? Well, uh, actually, I think there is a the, the, difference, but I agree with you. I would, I would shut down homeopathy as well. I would stop the sale of homeopathic remedies as well, I should or say. Or I, I wouldn't so much stop the sales. I would stop them making claims that they can't sustain. You see, this is the fundamental problem, and th this really cuts to the heart of it, of why these things exist at all in society. If we could educate everyone, as Chrissy suggests, that would be great. Unfortunately, that means educating everyone in society, which is a very expensive way of doing things. It wouldn't be so expensive. For instance, we could make laws to make no. his business more transparent. For instance, uh, the, the list with people he quote-unquote helped should be made public, and any reporter, anybody, any paranormal investigator could go to these people and ask them, look, this holy water, did they remove your illness? And that's how he would get exposed. What's the better way? 
Well, that's almost a fundamental problem, is there is a market for selling bullshit, whether it be homeopathy or this pop-off style, you know, you wave your hands at people, say, devil be gone. And that market is in the billions of dollars, and not billions. It's certainly in the millions to tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions. And where is the market for actually showing that it's bullshit? It's basically the people who get stung by, you know, I put my faith in Popoff for curing my mother's cancer, and it didn't work. Now my mother's but dead. But let's um, not forget, Popoff was exposed on public television uh, in America, and yeah. after a couple of years, he came back. This is where it does get a little tricky um, in that homeopathy is probably the better analogy or anything like that, you know, any of these alternative medicines, because whilst they can be shown to have little or no detrimental effects, you know, this is why you don't have to go through the rigmarole of FDA approval for homeopathic drugs because they have no active ingredients. But you are actually stopping people who would otherwise get real treatment from getting it. And this is if you, the, the, the thing that allows them to do this is that they can make claims that are not valid. And I think that's where you need actual legislation to stop people from making claims that basically enable them to sell false hope. I would agree with that. I would think that as long as you sell something, you, you have to have some standards. You know, you have to say why this specific thing help you, and if it doesn't come true, then, you know, you shouldn't be allowed to say that. I just don't think everybody should be banned altogether, because I think this would only, you know, make people put even more faith in them, because everybody loves a martyr. When you're selling an idea, it becomes this weird nebulous place where people can choose to embrace the idea, then who is in fault? Is it my fault? If I lose my house, is that just a stupid tax? <laughs> you know, do I have that coming? Or is it someone else's fault for taking me in a vulnerable state and convincing me that I should give my life savings because God will bless me? I want to talk real fast about how science and the church have this weird relationship. And check me on this, all three of you. But growing up in the church, we were taught that, well, don't totally trust science. Science, there's an agenda. Science is tainted. Science is run by a secular group. Science is this. Science is trying to kill God. Science, science, science. And, and normally they taught us to distrust. Then let's say they find a piece of quote unquote evidence that supports a biblical claim and they take science and they put a, a three piece suit on it and they walk it out in front of everybody and say, look, it's science and it proves our position. It's this weird paradox where they say, don't trust it. But hey, by the way, if we see something that buttresses our religion, science is now the hero. Do you guys see that? Yeah, it's all over the place. Science, bitches, it works. That's all that needs to be said. It's It's the only epistemology that actually has a track record of working. It's the only way that we've actually found that acquires us knowledge that allows us to make computers, mobile communication devices, that allows us to have these sort of Skype conversations with each of us in a different time zone. The miracle of science makes the miracles of Jesus look like callow party tricks. I've got a slightly more radical approach uh, than the other two. Mine is that these people should not be allowed to benefit from the advantages of science. And in, as well, they should be made to wear dog tags. So if they get knocked down in the street and the paramedics arrive, they will check and they say, OK, this one's religious. Rather than waste time taking to to a hospital, Take they should to be driven church. to the nearest church, left on the <laughs> steps of the church. And then You're not really serious, people. though. Well, uh, I mean, what a wonderful so idea that would be. Then you'd very, very find, quickly find out what they really believed and where they genuinely put their trust. And it is in doctors and science and medicine rather than God. There's this great sort of instant counter to, you know, there are no atheists in foxholes. Yeah, I mean, it's not true anyway. But the quick counter is, yeah, and there are no theists in hospital waiting rooms. You, you make a very, very valid point. It's, it's so powerful. You just wonder why on earth... There are so many people that are still believing this nonsense when they don't lead their lives by it. I, 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 I'm sorry, I interrupted. 
Let, probably best if we don't go down that route. Let's move on. No, I, I, I think it's a fascinating question. For me personally, my upbringing was raised, by, I was raised by theologians. They were not just believers. They were biblical scholars. There was no choice. There was God is real. God is in the sky. Jesus came to earth 2000 years ago. He died for your sins. Heaven and hell are real places. The Bible is true. And what they did was, is they conditioned us as very, 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 very young, impressionable minds to distrust anything that came against that foundation. So for, for me, for my part, it was, if something didn't fit, I'm the problem. I'm not smart enough. God is bigger than me. I just have to have faith. It's that lazy reasoning that we hear now so often that makes us crazy. I don't know about you, but if I hear the more it doesn't make sense, the more I know it's got to be a God thing. Well, it, that used to make sense to me. And now I look at it and it makes me want to just bang my head against the wall. That That's one of the, it's the Miss South Carolina answer. It's so incomprehensible that it must be a sign from God. You know the one that I'm talking about? Yeah, the Miss Teen South Carolina, the most incoherent answer ever given at a beauty contest. I remember. Yeah. Proof that God exists because it doesn't make any sense. Christina? I have to, yeah, I have to go again against like popular opinion. I, I don't care if people believe in God. I really, really don't. I mean, like I've said time and time again, for me, what matters is they have social secular values. They they don't go hating on the gays. They don't, you know, try to stop abortion rights. They don't take away women's reproductive rights. They don't go against science. Otherwise, just believing in God, I have absolutely no problem with it. And as an ex theist, I perfectly understand it. Like when something is out of your hands. And there is nobody, there is something that you can rely on because your faith makes you rely on God, then it's comforting. And just, you know, saying that, okay, God has a plan, again, is comforting for somebody, for instance, who loses their child and could lose their mind trying to figure out how the hell this happens. But then, you know, my baby is with God. It was his plan. It's a comfort type of thing. And even if I don't personally engage in that anymore, I can understand that and I'm not opposed to that. You can pray to whatever God you want to as long as you hold secular values. This well, is for me at least. I may part ways a little bit with you from the perspective that coping and coping in a healthy way. I mean, I think a healthy reality-based coping mechanism is important. If if I'm a parent who loses a child and someone comes up to me and comforts me by saying that God needed another angel in heaven and it's all part of his divine plan, it, it, that, that may make me feel better in the short run, but is that a healthy way to cope? Or would it be better for me to understand that Sometimes life is messy and horrible things happen, and I need to deal with the reality of it and move on. Yeah, well, I mean, some I, I th people cannot move on. I mean, some people literally lose their mind after something like that. To me, you know, anything that's comforting to them, to them and helps them through this without hurting anybody, without having any negative impact on others, that, that's whatever. I don't care. I'm not, you know, militating against that particular part of faith. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it boils down to would you rather be happy or right? And whilst I would agree with Chrissy on the caveats that as long as it doesn't affect anyone else, then, you know, what you do in the privacy of your own mind, your, your problem. You, in in your mind, you can do and think whatever you want. But if you're actually going to start basing, ac if you're going to get actionable items from this this phantasm, uh, that then starts carrying a social price with it, um, and frequently that that price is pretty high. Do the three of you identify yourselves as atheists? I know Thunderfoot's been talking about a rebranding of non-belief oh, or rationalism. You haven't. Come on. Like, this annoys me so much when I hear, like, big names within the atheist community, if I can call it that. You know, don't, let's not call ourselves atheists. Let's call ourselves evolutionists or humanists or secularists or rationalists. Like, for fuck's sake, we're, we're atheists. Okay? <laughs> we don't only... believe in God. We're atheists. <laughs> 
My only objection to the title is atheism is typically the conclusion. Rationality is the methodology. Well, I am. I can call myself a rationalist and a humanist and a skeptic and also an atheist. Those things don't make me less of an atheist. I'm still an atheist. It's a label that I'm not against. I embrace it because it characterizes me. When I started the thinkingatheist.com website in 2009, I at the time was like, well, it was when I began thinking for myself that I came to the position of atheism. But even now, three years later, I wonder if that was the correct brand. Not because I'm, I agree with Dawkins. I think the word should be embraced because we need to destigmify it. I mean, it's an absence of a belief in God. But I also well, think that Thund Thunderfoot has a great point. He's talking about how do you define yourself by an absence of a belief, where he calls himself a rationalist. Or uh, I saw the word pearl, and I didn't know if Thunderfoot wanted to to speak to that or not? I mean, are you rebranding using a specific term? Uh, yeah, to an extent, rationalist more or less encompasses it. Uh, if you were to describe what you believe in, then the principal methods used by uh, scientific naturalism is physical evidence and reasoned logic, which would be the anagram pearl. If you want to go a step back further than that, you can go to practical models of utility about reality, which is basically that's what everyone does. That's that's but, all we essentially do as humans. I love Daniel life. Dennett to death. I'm a huge admirer of Daniel Dennett. Every time he talks about the brights, I want to crawl through my computer screen. Let me make another point. I mean, atheists just don't believe in God. Atheists are not necessarily skeptics, are not necessarily rationalists. I I know atheists who are truthers, you know, who believe that 2012 right. will bring the apocalypse and they don't so, believe in God and they're still atheists and they're still in the same category with them on this specific issue because I don't believe in God and they don't believe in God and that's it. But that's why I, f I find it not a very useful term. Uh, you're describing things by what they're not. In, in that sense, you, I think you're better off actually describing yourself by what you are than what you're not. I'll tell you why it makes sense. It's because 85% of the entire world population has a religion. And when it's a majority that big, and it, it will eventually come down to even like in, in a census, in you know statistics in interviews everywhere what are your religious beliefs and i say i'm an atheist meaning i have none this is a word that i, I i'm not gonna say if somebody asks me what are your religious views i'm not gonna say well you know i'm a rationalist or i'm a humanist because that's a different area that's a different area from religion atheism is specific to religion and to nothing else nothing else just religion dpr did you want to weigh in at any point <laughs> yeah i want to agree with you i can't stand the expression bright i think it's <laughs> arrogant i think it's pathetic and it's awful um, i think it's great for one reason only because when we do adopt the always look on the bright side of life as, national <laughs> oh. anthem, as the national anthem for atheism, it's a great pun on bright. I understand what he was trying to accomplish. Life. You know, he's coming up with a supposedly catchy, happy, one-syllable thing, and I, I just see it as completely wrong-headed. I can't get my head around it. That said, I also have a problem with... Um, skeptics or skepticism and i think that that is a, a, a slightly different slight difference in language um and the use of language because here i think skepticism has a slightly negative connotation to it and implies that you're somewhat closed-minded or not open to possibilities and I, I i don't think it's quite the same in america but as i i, I have a problem well, for, for, for that, me that what i mean by well. skeptic i just hate when labels i describe I think. myself um, is let me go back. Sorry, do, um, Let me go back. You hate labels of any kind? Well, I, I, I think too much time is spent arguing about semantics. I, it's an, it's, I suppose it's a necessary evil. Well, the word probably wouldn't have to exist if we didn't have people walking up to us, at least here in the 50 states, and saying 90% of all Americans believe in God. Of course, 
they haven't actually studied those statistics to realize that that belief in God also encompasses UFOs and ghosts and, you know, <laughs> and the spirit of Elvis and all these other wild things that fall under the God umbrella. But when people come to you and they position themselves from a theist point of view, you just say the word, well, I'm an atheist. I don't exactly. buy it. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I, I, I think uh, you've, it's, you've, it is contingent on what arena, what forum you're in. In America, I think you're right, using the word atheist, even though it's, it wouldn't be my first choice of title, it would be one that I would use in America for two reasons. First of all, you've got to destigmatize the word. And secondly, everyone knows what you're talking about when you say I'm an atheist. And yeah. plus like these labels I, I think they are useful i mean i know people are starting more and more to hate labels and i don't see why that is for instance when somebody asks you so do you believe in creation and you can say no i'm an evolutionist or no i'm an atheist and not necessarily mean that you're an evolutionist because you can be an atheist and believe that aliens planted human beings on earth there are just plenty of so, people who don't believe in god who believe that just so you know the evolutionist is one that really does just grind my gears because you don't get gravitationalists and uh, Faradayists and all this sort of thing. You know, it, yeah, but it, you don't have the opposite. Like, what would be the opposite of uh, a gravitationalist, whatever? There well, is a minority is of people who believe a the floater? contrary. Yeah, a <laughs> floater. Yeah. But when there is a majority of people who believe in creation, I think it's useful to have a word that counters that. You know, that you say that and people know exactly what you mean. But it is almost unique in uh, being defined by what you don't believe in. There aren't, you don't call people non capitalists or a capitalists or a republicans. You, you the call other one, them by just, what they you, actually You call believe, people not by what anarchists. Yeah. What, do you, what do you make of Darwinist? That one really pisses me off. Oh, oh I'm sorry, I'm swore. <laughs> when I hear Darwinist, it's usually in correlation. It, it, somewhere in that same sentence, I hear the name Hitler, and that yeah, sends me exactly. through the roof. Is there, and I asked you this question when we were in D.C. at the Reason Rally, and let me ask it again. I know it must go in phases, but is there a creationist or a theist or religious or superstitious argument that you hear so often or for whatever reason just makes you want to bang your head against the wall? Is there one that you just think, if I have to hear this again, I'm going to go nuts. It yes. takes more faith not to believe. Mine is the, where do you get your morals from if you don't believe in oh, God? Oh, that's so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that too. That's probably worse than it takes more faith not to believe. Like, I, I just, yeah, exactly. I and if that argument had merit, it. doesn't it mean that all of the non-believers, even if we were a tiny minority as they posit, we are, we would all be in the streets raping and killing and just a, the casual observer would realize that morality that exists. sounds like a fact-based argument to me. Well, or what I hear often is, and I heard this in the uh, when I saw the film Collision with Christopher Hitchens, was they say, well, if an atheist or a non-believer is moral, it's because they have borrowed their morality from God, from the Christian God or whatever religion they're supporting. Yeah, well, exactly. the only reason you're moral is because you borrowed your morality from us. It's still ours, but you're just using it on lease. There's, there is another even more horrific argument that occasionally is used, and that is that God has written morality into all of our hearts, whether we believe in him or not. And they base that, I think, on a passage from Romans. The other one that I foresee that we're going to hear a lot more of is the new style Eric Hoven philosophical argument. I don't. Um, you don't think we are? No, because it's dreadfully unconvincing even to... I mean, who would actually take a look at Eric Hoven's discussion and say, oh, well, obviously there's got to be a god. Yeah. Well, give me an example. What what argument are we speaking about here? Um, do you want to give a summary, DPR? Well, you had the conversation with him. You're probably okay. in the, the, the position. The argument basically goes along these lines that either absolute truth exists or it doesn't exist. And if it does exist, then you need God to explain it. Therefore, in order to know anything, God must exist. Now, yeah, my, my group, Grief or grievance with this is 
There is no such thing as absolute truth for the simple reason that it is actually fundamentally impossible to tell whether we are living in reality or in a matrix-style reality. Indeed, I think it was Arthur C. Clarke who said that the chances are we are living in a matrix-style reality because if you take the universe of the size that it is and just suggest that, well, there will be a lot of technologically advanced civilizations out there, many of which will be creating very um, realistic simulations of the the universe, then the number of simulated universes in the universe will greatly exceed the number of universes. So it's far more likely that you're actually in a computer simulation than in reality. Now this um, will not take off, obviously. This will sounds like the kind popular. of thing you might you might read between bong hits or something. That's pretty exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is why this is why Ray Comfort, you know, with his "God loves you" and you're a horrible, horrible, horrible person, but there's someone who wants to cuddle you is a far more well received argument than like you're saying. I mean, this is the sort of trippy arguments that you expect of space heads. And I mean, I think that theists, when they listen to Eric Hoven, they're like, this shit is boring, bring back Ray Comfort. One I hear quite a bit is, well, what caused the Big Bang? And I always cock my head like a dog when they say it, because part of me is like, well, just because science is does not have a definitive answer as to what caused the singularity that spun the universe into motion has has no bearing on Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, the Old and New Testament, and the stories written by Bronze Age primitives saying that that all these things happened. I mean, to, to make the leap from one to the other. Another one I heard this week was there was a young girl, poor thing, has got leukemia in a hospital. She's going through chemotherapy, going through all of these very, very complex and expensive man-made solutions to fight this horrible disease. And yet on Facebook, it's praise God, she had a good day. Thank you, Jesus. She's doing better today. God, God, God. So when obviously I'm scandalously raise the hand and say, don't forget to thank our physicians and nurses and support staff and scientists. The answer I get is, well, God made the doctors. And I, I don't, I have no idea what to say or how to respond. I, I just think I'm, sp I'm spinning my wheels. This is, it's, it's the facile shell game. I can explain anything by just injecting an extra unknown into it. And the easiest one is simply to play the shell game on their god. Well, your god couldn't exist without the great space vegetable and that couldn't exist without the flying spaghetti monster and that couldn't exist in order to explain god you need one extra entity i mean that's all they're doing is they're putting an entity in there which has no purpose for being there it's just to explain an unknown it's explaining one unknown with another it's it's facile the way i explain this thing with uh, thank god she had a good day i don't even bring doctors I, I would just answer what about the other girl with leukemia who had a horrible day and suffered immensely what about her god doesn't care about her there was a, a photograph floating around the internet just last week that showed a horrible car wreck there's a boy who is still in the wreckage in his the shredded bodies of apparently his two parents. And the photograph said, this boy sur survived an unsurvivable accident. Who's, who can say that there is no God? And of course, he's two feet from the mangled, twisted, shredded corpse of a parent. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, this very much reminds me of whatever it was, Pope John Paul II, I think it was, you know, who swore blind that it was the Lady Fatima who guided the bullet and stopped it from hitting his heart. Uh, and I think it was Dawkins at this marvellous line, well, it's just a shame she couldn't have actually moved the bullet another few inches yeah. and stopped it from hitting him altogether. Yeah, that, I mean, that, would have been, me, that would have been the miracle if, you know, the car is completely un, completely wrecked and everyone walks out fine. Or 9-11, uh, uh, yeah. you know, the yeah. planes crash into the building and everyone walks out fine. For me as a theist, this was the, the one thing that always bothered me. Like, even when I was little, even when I was deeply religious, the, the problem of evil, I didn't even know there is an entire segment in philosophy addressing this. Why there is 
so much bad stuff in the world. And, you know, when people told me, well, Adam and Eve and blah, 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 what about the animals? What the hell did they do? You see, like, deers, some maggots are in their eyes, eating their brain, and all this horrible, horrible stuff that happens all over nature. I just couldn't explain God with that. I just figured, well, I don't understand it. Well, I can explain it. Free will. It's free will. It's our fault as a species that this happened, and it stems back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. If they hadn't done the apple, it's a fallen fallen world. The uh, the maggots would not be in that deer's eyeball right now if Eve had just walked away. There we go. All the problems in the world can be traced down to a woman. (laughs) <laughs> yes, I could understand, you know, us being punished as a species. That part I explained to myself. But how can you punish another species for what we did if God is so just? Well, it's the and same me- culture that tells the Noah's Ark story, not to drag this particular thread on. But, you know, when I was a kid, it was a happy story. God saved Noah and his family and the animals. Yeah, and it was a story with... And committed global genocide. (laughs) With rainbows and doves and mountains and land, and God promised he would never flood the earth again. And looking at the story now, I'm like, God drowned the, what, the disabled, the the elderly, the unborn, the, the, you know, the deaf, the mute, he drowned everybody. Looking back, you, I have this. The old, the the strong, the weak, the artist, the philosopher, everybody. Before I wrap things up with all three of you, and I want to thank you for spending an hour with me. It's a tremendous honor to speak to you. When I was at the Reason Rally, I had a chance to shake hands with Richard Dawkins, and it is one of the highlights of my life, not to fawn too much, but I, his book was the second book I had read on my own journey out of religion. And he's been a tremendous influence on me and so many others. I had a chance to see so many others. Lawrence Krauss was out there and and all these people who inspire me. But one thing I noticed at the Reason Rally is that the people that I ran into were just as or more excited about meeting you guys. And I wanted, I think it's a testament to just how effective you have been in relating to people and presenting good information. There's something unique about the era in which we live, the YouTube era, where somebody with a message and a compelling way to present it can be heard. I don't think it can be overstated that you, that you are really making a tangible difference in lives. You certainly made one in mine. You're making me blush, uh, Seth. Whatever. It's a very kind words, but unfortunately, in my case, totally untrue. I'd be wandering around at the convention or at the rally with Thunderfoot, and people would stop and ask for a photograph to be taken, always with him. I'd be the one holding the camera, taking the picture. And whilst I'm taking the picture, they'd be saying, oh, I do love your magic sandwich show. And I'm thinking, hang on, I'm part of that too. No one recognised me. So it's very kind words. But, well, uh, Thunder, how did you feel at being being constantly recognised and asked for photographs? Um, to be honest, it caught me almost completely off guard. I was expecting you know, maybe one or two people to to know who I was, but nothing like what was actually there and you know, as I said earlier the other thing that caught me uh, it, it was obvious especially when you look back at, at the tapes is just how young everyone was and that's if anything the thing that convinced me that this is actually having an impact this is something that we need to keep going and and yeah almost ever since the the reason rally I've been sort of scratching my head of thinking of ways to actually energize the community to keep it moving forwards because it does make a really good contribution. I mean, all of us here and many others, but people don't make material as often as they used to. And I think that's something that if we don't address, we will have a diminished impact in the future. Do you want to weigh in, Christina, real fast? I mean, your thoughts on the YouTube culture, the information that is now so easily available for anyone who cares to look? Yes, I think you can reach so many people over the internet. I discovered it and I just discovered like an entire different universe. And with people recognizing me and so on, it was a shock for me too. I, especially the first time when that happened, because here in my country I was recognized three times and I was kind of scared all three times because people were giving me the bad looks. I was expecting like tomatoes thrown at my head. And then I go to US and everybody's so nice and everybody is so receptive. 
Am I the only one with a site outside of YouTube? I know the Magic Sandwich Show is on Blog TV. Is there another site anywhere? Um, right. There are likely to be a few in the near future. The Magic Sandwich Show does have a blog site, but it, it's it's getting someone to actually run it, and none of us seems to have the time or inclination to do it. But not a challenge um, that I totally understand. I'm sure you can relate. I am at the point now where I'm. I feel like I'm always doing the urgent and not mm. the important, and I yeah. need I need help, but it would be more logistically difficult to have someone else do it <laughs> than to just do it myself. I find myself in this weird place where I want to be more effective. How do I do it? How do we do it? Uh, the, absolutely. But the risk of sounding apocryphal, hallelujah, brother. I appreciate all three of you. Thank you so much for your time and, and for your insight. And I know our listeners do as well. We will be looking for your next work on YouTube, okay? Thank you very much. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com